that's the most fun part of my job is we have members that have goals from I want to be the best operator in this organization to I want to open my own nonprofit. Cool. So it, it's such a wide range and it, it's always fun to see what they're searching for. Welcome to the Voices of Manufacturing, where people share their stories, career journeys, and perspectives on the industry. This podcast is brought to you by Dazuki, empowering the frontline manufacturing workforce. And now, here is your host, Name Tag Scott. Welcome to another episode of the Voices of Manufacturing podcast. I'm your host, Name Tag Scott, and today's show is about transformation through learning. You're going to love our guest. She has a unique career path that took a fascinating turn, starting with shaping young minds as an English teacher and a learning leader in the Sheboygan School District. And now over at Johnsonville, she works as the learning and development coordinator. My favorite part is she is also certified in everything from mental health first aid to workshop facilitation to talent optimization, change management, maybe yoga. I'm not sure, but the list goes on and on. So she is not only helping manufacturers grow their skills, but doing the same for herself. So we'd love to see that. Please welcome to the show, Samantha Lawrence. Hi, Scott. Thank you. Happy to be here. Is it true that Sheboygan is the Malibu of the Midwest? That is allegedly true. (laughs) No, it's a great spot to live being on Lake Michigan. It's really beautiful. And there is quite a bit of lake surfing that happens so it has earned that that title did you grow up there i did not i'm actually from minnesota originally Ah, yeah that's that's a big manufacturing hub because 3m Mm -hmm. is in minnesota yeah i'm glad you brought that up that was actually one of the things that i was like i think we'll get to talk about that a little bit today and yeah yeah and do you remember that in terms of when you were growing up if 3m had a presence or if that was a big deal in minnesota yeah, it. I do remember. So actually, I'm from St. Paul. Okay, and got it. 3M is headquartered in St. Paul. And then I also have roots in Two Harbors, Minnesota. And okay. Two Harbors is actually where 3M started. Oh. So it's interesting, like, they have wide roots, just like I do in the same spots that I do. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, I remember them having a really large presence. They're headquarters is like right on the freeway. Okay. So you see it all the time when you're driving around town. And I remember specifically at Christmas time, they, and I think they still do this today. Hope maybe we, you have some listeners that work yeah. there that could weigh in, but yeah, we do. they, they would leave certain office lights on ah. at Christmas time in this huge sky skyscraper type building. And it would make a Christmas tree formation. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it was always like really fun at Christmas time as a kid to drive by and see that. But Oh, I love that. Yeah. My grandpa worked there. So really, what did he do there? He was an engineer. Ah, yeah. His whole career, he worked there. And then my mom also worked there and she was in the chemistry area. Wow. So although you don't have a a traditional manufacturing background, it it certainly runs in the family, it sounds. Yes, it does. Cool. Do you remember seeing the products that they made or or learning at all about manufacturing because they were there? Yeah. So I think the biggest one is probably post-it notes. Mm. (laughs) My grandpa always had tons of post-it notes all across his desk in the basement. So cool. I, I remember seeing those and he still gets discounts on those products. Of course so he does. If I ever need sticky notes, post-it notes, I'm like, hey, put <laughs> <pick> me up. <laughs> That's right. My grandfather does not have a manufacturing background, but has the best sticky notes in his like wood shop in his basement. Oh, yeah. And I, I always think that like when he's no longer with us, if I have to go get something to remember him, I want the notes. I'm going to take the sticky notes of turn off at 9 p.m. Like I want that as a memory. So somehow sticky notes have made, have been able to make these interesting memories that we have of our family members. Yeah. They're, and they are so ingrained in us. I feel like I recently got a little desktop whiteboard Mm. and that I can write my little notes when people come up to me and need something or I need to do a follow-up and 
even today, someone came up to me for a follow-up and I gra- went and grabbed a sticky note and wrote it on yeah. that instead. I'm like, oh, I can't get away from the sticky note. <laughs> no, we, we may never get away from them. Growing up in this manufacturing type town, what was the first job you ever had? The first job I ever had was working at Brugger's Bagels. I don't know why yeah. I was interested in like food, <laughs> but it led me to having waitressing jobs in okay. high school and college. So I was in that environment, which was interesting. I learned a lot about customer service, that's for sure. <laughs> Shouldn't it be like a, a law that Congress passes that everyone in America works for six months in a food service job? A hundred percent. Yeah. Six months in food service, six months in retail. And then I think we'd all yes. be a little bit more understanding of each other. I'm telling you, the, the forgiveness quotient of our country would go up by an order of magnitude. I've, I've done them both. And I just, I, you treat people differently. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, you ultimately went into education. Was that kind of the plan when you were coming of age? Not really. I shouldn't say not really. So I thought when I was in high school, it's funny that you mentioned my certifications because I'm actually back in school right now for my global career development facilitator certificate. That's Of course you are. Yeah. (laughs) So I've been doing a lot of reflection on how I came to this this place that I'm in now. Originally in high school, I thought I wanted to be a like a preschool teacher or maybe elementary school. Hmm. So I was leaning towards that. My grandparents on my other side, they had backgrounds in education. So I was familiar with that. And then I did a job shadow with a preschool teacher hmm. in my town. And after that, I was like, oof. I can't, I don't think I have the patience to do that all day. Whoa. That's a lot. (laughs) Preschool of all the ways you could teach seems to be the hardest. Yes. They just have a mind of their own. Then I thought I wanted to go into marketing. Okay. So I declared my major, my freshman year of college as marketing. I was like, this sounds so cool. This is what I want to do. First semester of college, I took some Excel classes, math, statistics, and I was like, Nope, this is not it either. <laughs> yeah, I, you got to you have to do statistics in business school. I remember failing that miserably. I took it twice. Yeah, why is it so tricky? Hard. <laughs> but so then I was back at the drawing board, and I'm like, I think I do want to explore teaching again. I wanted to make mm. a difference, and yeah. that's the best way that I knew how. And I declared a new major of secondary education. So cool. yeah, sixth through 12th grade. And that was my degree. What my de- That is what my degree is in. Did you have teachers growing up that inspired you? I did. I had a few, I had an English teacher that I, I and unfortunately I don't remember her name, but yeah. I remember her impact. She was just so caring and mm. charismatic, but also at the same time, very stern. And I remember we all failed a paper miserably. Like there was not one person that did a good job on this paper. And she came in and and just the way that she held us accountable, but also took ownership on herself Hmm. was really admirable to me. There was her, I had a health teacher that was pretty incredible. And yeah. When you started teaching, did you want to emulate that kind of mindset? I did. I did. I was a young teacher, right? Uh, I was fresh out of um, college teaching high schoolers and middle school students. I was closer in age to them than most of their teachers were. Right. I knew that I'd have to overcome that. I did always try to have a very approachable, but also stern demeanor, which I think went well. Yeah. One of my friends from high school became a chemistry teacher at our high school. And I remember at like our five-year reunion or 10-year reunion, I said, how's it going? He's like, I think the secret to teaching high school is act like you've known your whole life what you learned in the car on the way to school that morning. (laughs) Yeah, fake it till you make it. (laughs) I use that motto a time or two in my career as well. And they ask you a question and you're like, I don't know. You should look that up. You should do some research and let me know. And then they love that too. Yeah. 
Empower them. Yeah. Put them to work. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the path of being a school teacher and then now working at Johnsonville, talk about like how you made that switch and, and what led you into this strange world of manufacturing. Yeah. It's a fun story. So I really didn't think much of manufacturing or, or, or getting a role in manufacturing when I was growing up. And it wasn't until I moved to Sheboygan, which is where I am now, that I started to be more immersed in this world. And it was actually done through, I started teaching at Sheboygan South High School, and there was this organization called Inspire Sheboygan County. Okay. And they, th their role as an organization was to connect students and teachers with organizations in the community, whether it be a manufacturing organization, a, a marketing organization, whatever it is. So when I started teaching in Sheboygan, they actually took all of the new teachers on a day trip to a local business. Cool. And I ended up at Johnsonville. Nice. Of all the places. So yeah. that's when I really started to learn more about manufacturing and all of mm -hmm. the different facets that there yeah. are within this world. Actually, when I started to transition and look for a different career outside of the public education world, I contacted the person that I had met when I was on my tour at Johnsonville. Nice. As a teacher. Yeah. So it's always good to, to make connections. And I reached out to her and, and I said, I'm looking for a role. Um, in learning and development. And I know there's an opening at Johnsonville. Are you willing to talk with me and help me prepare for my interview, run through my presentation? And she was more than happy to do that. So cool. yeah, I think for me, leaving teaching, I, I still wanted to have an impact and yeah. I just wanted to do it in a different way. COVID right. changed a lot of things for me yeah. about teaching and the way I wanted to live my personal life too. So yeah, I'm really happy to be where I am today. It sounds like there's a lot of overlap between public school and what you're doing now in terms of having an impact. Yes, definitely. I work with a facility of 400 plus members. Wow. So I get to have a big impact. <laughs> When you were on the tour that you took that eventually led you to, to working there, do you remember what you were watching being made? Yeah, I was watching ready to eat, so pre-cooked broth. Nice. Uh, being made. So yeah, pretty cool. I do not work in a ready to eat facility. I work in a fresh facility Got now, it. but ready to eat one's right across the road. I see it yeah. every day. <laughs> Forgive me if everyone says this, but you literally watch where the sausage is being made, right? Yeah, literally. Is, are, are, are you not allowed to say that because it's so cheesy or is it okay to say that? Uh, that's okay to say that. This is Wisconsin. We like cheese. So yeah, it can be as I, cheesy I, as you need to be. I figured. I, I'm from the Midwest. So I'm like, yeah, I think they'll be okay with that. Oh yeah. We love it. <laughs> Something I mentioned earlier was about licenses and certifications, which I think is really interesting. I some people just love doing that and it's a big part of their life and some people it's not. And I was just curious, did you get into learning and development because you got the licenses and certifications or did you get them because you were in it? Like it's like a chicken egg thing. Yeah. I, so that's a really good question. I love to learn. I've yeah. always loved to learn, but when I got into my role I'm in today, I did not have a background in learning okay. and development, right? Yeah. It was in education, but not the business side of things. So I really wanted to take every opportunity that Johnsonville would provide me with. Oh yeah. Um, to learn more and to become certified in the areas that I knew I would need to learn more about. So yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like the right move if 400 employees who are on the factory floor, they're getting certifications and licenses, like you're no different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and tell me the one again, you mentioned this before, there's another certification you're in school for right now. What is it? That is the Global Career Development Facilitator. Mm. 
yeah, GCDF for short. Of so, course, the GCDF, yes. Yeah, who doesn't know that? <laughs> it, it's basically, it's a career coaching certification. So I'll be a certified career coach. Um, nice. By the middle of this year. Who, who is that through or, or what organization? It's through NCDA, National Career Development Association, owns the curriculum. And then it's okay. actually through Normandale Community College, which is out nice. of Minnesota. Of all yeah. <laughs> Give me a couple snapshots. What's something that you might learn or might apply in this like career coaching that you might use with the manufacturing team? Yeah. So some things that I've already been using there. I, the first thing we did was learn a lot about career development theory, which isn't oh, something interesting that a lot of us probably think about every day. But it was really interesting to see all the theories, different theories that exist and find one that resonated with me from a career coaching perspective. And I've already started using it with my members and that's cool. John Holland's theory, okay. which is the idea that we each have a unique personality and unique characteristics. And every work environment and every job also has unique characteristics. And we will be the happiest and most content in a job that matches with our characteristics and personalities. Yeah. You start out with an understanding of what your client, or for me, what the member I'm working with is looking for in in their career and and sometimes they don't know sometimes they have an idea and sometimes they are very set on something so it, it really all depends but you do this assessment with them called the reactic code assessment and it's going to ask them questions about different um, jobs different skills yeah. and how likely they would want to be to learn more about that and then it'll cool. ask them about how much training or schooling they are able to put towards this new career at this time in their life, right? I work with people ages 18 to people in their 60s. So nice. it varies, really totally varies the, the amount of training that they're willing to put in or want to put in or can put in at this time in their life. So what I'll ask that, and then based off of that, it's going to come up with a reactive code, a three-letter code, and, and generate a list of occupations that would fit with that code. And from there, then we go into learning more about the top occupations that interest mm. them from that list and doing cool. some informational interviews. So that's just one of the many things. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it makes me wonder if as careers change and evolve, as the world evolves, like COVID, for example, I wonder, are there new career path theories coming out now that the world is different? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'd have to do some research. I, I'm not sure, but there definitely are some that are more historical and more right. that are some that are more recent. So I'm sure there will be new ones coming out. I've been reading some about this idea of career career jumping or career hopping, but it, almost what I've done, right? Like you start with this degree in this one area and then you transition to a completely different occupation. Right which is very interesting uh, to me. Yeah. So let's say you have someone coming in, a frontline worker, first day on the job or first week, and you're working with them, and but they have a totally different background like you. They came from a different type of world that's not manufacturing. So how do you help them connect the dots between their past experience and this new world in a way that makes them still feel mm -hmm. excited? Yeah, I think it's about helping them to understand what transferable skills right. they have. So what were some of the things that you learned and you got really good at in your past occupation? And how do those translate here? And also, how do those translate maybe not even to the role you're in today, but the role you want to be mm. in the future? A lot of people don't think of those transferable skills. Um, right off the bat. So I, I like bringing those to light and, and helping them to see like, you already have a lot of incredible right. skills and things that you bring to the table. Why not use them here? Do you map it out or is there some sort of framework where they can look on a whiteboard and see how it maps over? I have not done it that way. Usually I do it in a more casual conversation based yeah. way, but cool. I like that idea. I may have to steal that. I mean, that's, that's the way my brain works. Uh, I would still want to do it in a sort of conversational way, but I'm always like, all right, let's get on a whiteboard. You can do these 10 things. What does that look like 
working on a million dollar machine producing mm -hmm. sausage or something like that. Yeah, that'd be great for the visual learners. Right, which yeah. not everyone is. What's your learning style of the different ones that are available? I am pretty, I lean pretty heavy towards reading, writing. That's not a surprise yeah. as I was an English teacher. Um, I love to take notes and write things down, um, so. but I'm also kinesthetic. So I like yeah. to do the thing that you are trying yeah. to teach me how to do, especially if it's something like with the computer or yeah. on an iPad. Yeah. In manufacturing, do you see people favoring kinesthetic because it's such a, a manual type of process? Yeah, a lot of our members that come in have a kinesthetic learning style. There yeah, are sense. some that have that are reading writing as well. Usually you'll see them on the floor with a little notebook that we've given them to, nice. to write down all of the steps. Some Perfect. are visual. So we'll pull out our Dazuki work instructions. Awesome. Yeah, really good. Awesome. Okay, we have reached halftime at the Voices of Manufacturing today, and this is my favorite segment because we get to go back in time and find out what happened on this day in manufacturing history. Samantha, are you ready to play? I think so. <laughs> All right, let's do it. On this day. On this day. So we're going to crank up the gears and forge some knowledge, and here's how the game works. I'm going to share three pivotal moments in manufacturing history. You have 30 seconds to answer multiple choice questions, and if you get all three of them right, you will win one million Dazuki dollars. Mm High -hmm. stake. Those are non-redeemable. They are fake. <laughs> it's fake cryptocurrency. It actually gets you nothing. But <laughs> that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to uh, paste the questions in the text chat box right here so you have it for your reference. Number one, on this day in manufacturing history, back in 1936, this was the completion of construction of the Hoover Dam. And this was a monumental engineering achievement at the time. But the real milestone was completing production of the dam in the heat in southern Nevada. A lot of hardship, a lot of sickness quite a bit of death. So what do you think was the highest temperature on record during production of the Hoover Dam? Was it A, 109 degrees, B, 119 degrees, or C, 125 degrees? I'm going to say C, 125. You are correct. Can you imagine? Oh my God. No, that sounds awful. <laughs> right. What What is the uh, average temperature within like a Johnsonville production facility? It's on the opposite side of the spectrum, so it's around 40 degrees. 40 degrees doesn't sound so bad, but 125, that's, oof. Yeah, I'd rather have 40. Yeah, you, you can always put more clothes on, but unfortunately, right. yeah, not hygienic to just take it all off. Okay, <laughs> question number two, you are one for one, so far doing good. On this day in manufacturing history, back in 1885, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, is incorporated. But this is interesting. I found out that they made 47,900 phones across the country during that time. But what about today? A hundred years later, Apple produces a lot more phones than that. So how many iPhones on average does Apple make every year? Is it A, 10 million iPhones, B, 220 million iPhones, or C, 100 million iPhones? Oh, I'm going to go with B, 220 million. Oh, you're on fire. Two for two. You are correct. 220 million iPhones. Oh my God. It's so many phones. That is so many phones, but Hey, I, I love my iPhone. <laughs> I do too. I have my original iPhone three from, mm -hmm. I don't know, 2009 or whenever that came out. And it's my alarm clock in the morning. And I had to buy a special alarm clock hook, like a docking station because they don't make them anymore. I had to buy it on eBay, <laughs> but <laughs> I like my old phone. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, you're on a roll. Last question. Let's see if you can get it right. On this day, in manufacturing history, back in 1999, the Sony PlayStation 2 went into production. The global rollout marked a significant advantage in the gaming history, but the real success is due to the robot-operated and almost fully automated factory in Tokyo. In the current factory for PlayStation, how many employees does each facility have on staff during their automated production? Is it A, a single foreman who oversees the whole operation, B, a team of 10 staff who work in 36-hour shifts, or C, two workers on the line and two to package the finished consoles. 
Ooh, this is tricky. I'm just thinking like of how much automation is in a right. facility right. nowadays. Let's see. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with A. Ah, oh, you blew it. I thought you were going to get all three of them right. <laughs> no. Oh. No. no. How disappointing. Sadness. No, the answer is three. There's two on the line and two to package the consoles. So a total of four. Okay. Now, wow. I'm still impressed. Two out of three, pretty darn good. And I'll tell you what, we're going to still give you that $1 million Dazuki dollars. Thank you. That is so kind. It takes six to nine months to be delivered, but it'll be there for you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Excellent job playing on this day in manufacturing history. We're going to move into the second half of uh, our interview. And I always think back to the movie Office Space. I'm not sure if you're uh, a fan or not. I haven't. I have not seen it. Put it on the list. One of the greatest movies, a 1999 movie. And the old joke from the movie for the people that love it is, what would you say you do here? They always ask that question. And when it comes to learning and development, I'm curious. You work at a food manufacturing company. What do you do all day? Yeah, great question. Something that I really love about my job is that it's different every day. No cool. day is the same. I love that personally. Some of the main things that I'm responsible for as a learning and development coordinator are new member onboarding. So cool. the overall process that our new members go through from day one with Johnsonville to day 10 and how they go through that journey on the plant floor. Cool. I'm also responsible for technical training. So we call it result blocks. We have this system of how we train people, but I'm responsible for keeping that process up to date and mm. making sure that our members move through it in a timely manner and that the training that they're receiving is high quality training. Yeah. Um, I oversee work instructions in that process. Mm -hmm. Our Dazuki team, we call them here, member development. So whether it's career coaching or talking to members about going back to school, getting them set up with tuition reimbursement, nice. those types of things. I also facilitate the more formal, some of the more formal courses over mm -hmm. at our global headquarters, which is across the street. I also will do facilitation in the plant. Um, and I work with very closely like with our plant leadership team to come yeah. up with training plans for members and for themselves when it comes to like succession planning. Mm. Um, yeah. And then the best part is continuing to learn about best practices in learning and development and make sure that our processes are up to date and also coach my wonderful team. I have to give them a shout out. I coach yeah. a team of learning and development specialists and they do incredible work. They're the boots on the ground for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. I want to, there's a bunch of stuff you said I want to talk about. Training plan. Talk about yeah. when you're working with a manufacturing team, like what's like the approach and the thought process of coming up with a training plan? Yeah, great question. We actually started a new process last year called training predictability. Mm. And it is, it was focused. It really came out of two things. First was we had a lot of new members post COVID and we were about a year into their tenure with Johnsonville and they were coming up as past due in their training. Uh, right. And I, it was concerning to us as a leadership team because about 50% of our facility was in that bucket at that mm. time. On the same end, we were in a, an interesting economic environment and needed to make sure that we were, whatever training we were doing was effective and efficient. Hmm. So it was like, how do we do this? So through conversations with our operations team, we, we came up with this process and it's really a process of prioritizing member, a certain group of members each month or every two months. And then we meet with the team leaders. So the frontline leaders of the plant weekly to discuss where will that member be training um, this upcoming week, who will they be training with? What are they going to be learning? Are they on track to complete their training yeah. by the end of this time frame? We also like to try to train from easiest line or easiest piece of equipment 
to the most difficult. We don't okay. like to throw members onto the most difficult right. thing first because it can be discouraging. Sometimes we, this is manufacturing, so sometimes it doesn't always work out that way, but that is what we try to follow. I, when, I suppose when you introduce someone to a lower level task, you, it allows them to build some confidence and have some agency as they progress, right? Okay, a couple other things you said uh, when you were talking about your daily activities. Your team, what kind of staff are you working with and then what are they doing versus what, are your, what you're doing? Yeah, so I, I have a team of learning and development specialists and they, like I said earlier, they're really the boots on the ground. So yeah. my role is more, strate- more strategy-based. Yeah. Um, and creating processes and like theorizing about these processes and how they right. work in our facility. And they are really on the execution side. So they are the ones that lead new member onboarding. They are right. the ones that um, work, create the work instructions. Um, but they also, they are all trying to grow in their careers and as learning and development professionals as well. So it's been exciting to watch them grow and to bring them into more of the strategic side and those conversations. And I think they're really enjoying that too. When you have a a group of manufacturers and then they're going through onboarding, for example, have you ever had a moment where a, a new member gave you a piece of feedback that maybe you, made you reconsider something that you had put together strategically or, or their feedback changed the way that you did training? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have every member that we onboard in our organization, actually. So at okay. Johnsonville, we have them take a survey at the end of their 10th day. And it just asks them about their experience and what yeah. they would change. And so we read through those comments and that is really how we get feedback and how we make changes. I think for me, I had a very formal learning process ingrained in me as a teacher. And for me, it was coming up with more creative and innovative ways to learn. For example, like instead of just running through a PowerPoint of all of these like safety things that members need to know, like locations of things like a fire extinguisher, first aid room, things like that. We have them go on as a group or with a a partner, we have them go on a safety scavenger hunt around the facility to find those things, right? So there new members are always pushing us to come up with these creative and innovative things. What's what? Give me a couple other ones. How else have they made it fun or gamified it, made it interesting? Yeah, so we always do a Jeopardy game on their first, the end of their first day in the plant as well. Nice. Yeah. Um, so they get pretty competitive. Good. They should. Yeah, they should. That's great. <laughs> with that, so they get the opportunity to win some free product with that one. We also do a teach back. So if anyone mm. else listening is in the food manufacturing world, the most exciting part of onboarding is reading SOPs or standard operating. Of course, procedures. everyone loves it. Yeah, it's so fun. We, with that one, with our one of our SOPs, we actually chunk it out and split them in the team and cool. they read a section and then they have to come up with learning content to teach yeah. that back to the rest of the group. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. In a previous life, when I was doing a lot of corporate training, facilitating workshops, not unlike yourselves, I found that as opposed to me talking and delivering stuff, of just like, here's the book. Okay. You get chapter four, you get chapter five, you guys get chapter six, take 10 minutes, and then let's have some fun. Blow me away. Do the best thing you got. And they came up with stuff that I never would have done in a way I never would have done it. And I'm like, why am I here? Mm-hmm. It's amazing what they'll come up with if given the the agency and the office. My mentor used to tell me that the longer you have to do the teaching, the less you should actually teach and let them do it, right? Mm-hmm. 100%. Good rule of thumb. Okay, a couple other things I wrote down here. Great. So having not come from manufacturing originally, I'm guessing you were surprised by various things within this crazy world. So I'd love to hear what surprised you. What took you, threw you off a little mm-hmm. bit? What was strange to, to meet? I think there's a couple of things that really surprised me. So one thing was how fast things move Mm. in the manufacturing world. I 
thought teaching was fast paced. This is a way this doesn't teaching has nothing on manufacturing. Really? I, I, I don't think so. So we can be talking about a process, a new process one day in a meeting. And by the end of the week, our ops team has already implemented it and is searching for ways to make it better. Wow. So it, it's crazy how fast things move and how quick they're able to huh. operate. So that's one thing. I yeah. think something else that amazes me is just the technology that mm. exists in a manufacturing facility. The Just the automation and the robotics is incredible. I remember walking through the floor the first time and I just stopped and stared yeah. at this robot. And I was like, that is incredible. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's amazing. And then I think on the softer side, like, I, I'm always surprised by the dreams that our members have, the hopes and cool. dreams they have for themselves. That's the most fun part of my job is to get to talk through those things with members and help them work towards hopefully one day achieving that dream. And we have members that have goals from, I want to be the best operator in this organization to, I want to open my own nonprofit. Cool. So it, it's such a wide range and it, it's always fun to see what they're searching for, what they're hoping for. And it sounds like it's not just professional Johnsonville related dreams. This could be any dream that this human being has. Yep. The, the mission of Johnsonville is to create an environment that requires each of us to fully develop our God-given talents and help mm. others do the same. So whether that talent is Johnsonville related or not, right. It, it's still our responsibility to help them develop into that. I like the second piece of that too. It's paying it forward and helping mm -hmm. others do it. Um, it, it. Give me some examples of how that plays out in terms of mentorship and um, paying it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I look even at one of one of the members on my team. She was on the manufacturing floor. She was an operator and she wanted to become a trainer. A certified trainer which is another program that that i oversee cool and i was like yeah that's a great idea let's get you certified and then i saw something in her i just this natural talent for connecting with people and mm -hmm. making them comfortable and so fast forward we were in, amidst covid and we were going to bring on this larger group that we had recruited with an outside recruiting agency's help and it was unlike something that we had ever done before. And I uh, told her, I was like, I want you to come up with the onboarding process that they're gonna go through. I want you to come, come up with something new and different from what we do today. Yeah. And I want you to do it. I want you to onboard them. Cool. And she was nervous. Of course, good. <laughs> which is natural and that's a good thing. And then, so she did that. And then we opened, this was before the role of learning and development specialist even existed. So okay. later on, we opened that role up and she ended up going for it. And here she is today and wants Good to be in, in the coordinator role someday in the future. So yeah, it's beautiful so to see that process. That's incredible. It's got to be very rewarding for you to see her blossoming in that way. Yeah, it is. So if you work in manufacturing as a leader and part of your job is to develop people, when you see something like that in a person in the way that you saw with this woman, what do you say to them? I just want them to realize their potential and that like they can do anything that they set their mind to. Yeah. So even though it seems really scary or nerve wracking yeah. in the moment to do something different, it is going to be worth it in the end. And I think part of it is, is helping them see how capable they are and then also pushing them right. to do the thing that scares them. There's mm -hmm. this quote that goes around our organization that says some, it's something like, if you're not, if it's not making you puke in the sink, then it's not a big enough goal or it's not a big enough challenge. So I like to use that one a lot. Oh, that's so scary. I can't do that. I'm like, you should be puking in the sink. That's how you should be feeling. That's normal. <laughs> I cannot think of a better quotation for a food manufacturing company than puking in the sink. Yeah. And I don't know who came up with that quote. So <laughs> I cannot take credit for that. 
but I, whoever you are, I use that one weekly. <laughs> that is fantastic. I, part of me wants to brainstorm different ways to memorialize that, but that might be like a, a hygiene issue that we, we probably can't do. That may violate some GMPs, yeah. Right. It's, I don't know. If you had like plastic vomit and gave it away for the person <laughs> that did the scariest thing, I don't know. That's not a health code violation, right? There you go. Like a puke in the sink badge of honor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like the FDA would be okay with that. If <laughs> it's all, and this is uh, Samantha. She actually is the this month's winner of the puke in the sink badge. And she's yeah. going to like, yeah, look at that. Look at all the chunks. Sorry, it's disgusting. <laughs> I love it. And that's the part where I take it way too far. Okay. <laughs> we have reached just about the end of our program here today. But before we go, we'd like to do a little lightning round and do some creative brainstorming and ask you a few questions to take us out. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Samantha, if you could take a tour of any current manufacturing facility in the world, what would it be? So I thought a lot about this. And there's two things that I eat or or maybe to eat or drink every day. And it's okay. LaCroix, sparkling water, and chocolate. Mm. I like have to have those things on a daily basis. So yep. I did some research of where they manufacture LaCroix. So <laughs> that is the, I even wrote it down. I don't want to get it wrong. That is National Beverage in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I believe. Ooh. So I would love to go and see the LaCroix being made. That and chocolate. I'd love to go to a Hershey's chocolate factory yeah. and just like imagining the smells brings me joy. Like I'm not even there and I can smell it. Oh yeah. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Do you have a flavor of LaCroix that you go to? I really gravitate to the grapefruit. Grapefruit salad. Yep. I, I'm about as boring as you can get. I do the blue can, the, the no the, flavor at all. Yeah, the pure, it's, yeah. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. People think I'm crazy, but I'm like, it's good, man. Yeah, it's probably really crisp and, oh, yeah. That's what I want. I want it to burn the throat. That's the key. <laughs> okay, question number two. If you could go back in time and see any product being manufactured, what would it be? I think it would be the first microwave. Like, I know I could see a microwave being made today, right? Cool. They're everywhere. But I thought about imagine being part of that first group that made the first microwave and how innovative yeah. and like how it changed so many people's lives, the way they live their lives, their dinner time with their family. I would just love to be a fly on the wall in that space. I just found out it's back in 1947. That would be cool to see that. Yeah. All right. Question number three, if you were working on the front line, at Johnsonville, what music would you be listening to during your shift? Anything upbeat, pop music, mm. because when I walk out on the floor and the radios are playing pop music, I just start singing along and yeah. smiling and everyone else is singing and smiling and it's just so happy and everyone who works with me or knows me at all knows I love Taylor Swift. Got to give a of shout course. out to to my girl Taylor. So yeah, it'd probably be a lot of Taylor Swift. I don't know yep. if the members would be so happy with me about that, but. They would. Let's, <laughs> they let's not pretend. Yeah, you, you are not the first uh, Swifty to answer that question in that way. So I think that's the right answer. Okay, if you had an unlimited budget to teach any course at your company on any topic, what would it be? Oh my goodness, that is a really good question. I think it would probably be, oh gosh, it's a Brene Brown, Dare to Lead is the book. And yeah, you great can book. Become, yep, you can become certified as a Dare to Lead facilitator. So cool. I think it would be that because I think about like just the concepts of vulnerability and building your confidence. I think myself and a lot of members that I work with could benefit yep. greatly from that content. I agree. She talks about belonging a lot in her mm -hmm. books, which I really appreciate. And you use the term member today to refer to your team. And so belonging obviously mm -hmm. is, a, is something you practice. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Last question. What is your advice for someone on day one working in the manufacturing industry? Something I like to tell the members that I get to meet on day one is this experience is going to be what you make it. And I want you to take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. 
You never know what you're going to learn, what career path may transpire for you. And you really can be anything you want to be, especially at Johnsonville. So if you take the bull by the horn, there is, there's nothing you can't do. I love it. This is such a privilege that I get to talk to you today. Thank you. Privilege is all mine. The best thing I learned is if it's not making you puke in the sink, it's not a big enough dream. That's right. Thank you so much for joining us. And on behalf of everyone here at Dazuki and the Voices of Manufacturing Podcast, this is Name Tag Scott reminding you that if you don't write it down, it never happened. Goodbye, everybody. See ya. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Voices of Manufacturing Podcast. This show is brought to you by Dazuki, empowering the frontline manufacturing workforce. Check out Dazuki on LinkedIn to listen to past episodes and learn how your team can increase productivity and strengthen employee engagement.